Hi, my name is Terry Tao. I'm Program Director of the Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute over here at Nexus Community Partners. Hi everybody, my name is Angie Brown and I'm the Program Coordinator for the Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute. All right, so today we're going to um, present to you some information about um, the Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute or the BCLI program. So going to talk a little bit about Nexus, the origins of the program, and then Angie Brown, the program coordinator, will talk a little bit about the model itself, the training, and any import important dates for you all to remember in for this year. So who is Nexus? We are a community building intermediary. We've been around for about 11 years, and we've done a lot of work looking um, at communities of color in the area of uh, in three geographic areas, as well as we've been doing some regional work recently around the corridors opportunity and their transit work. We basically run um, run a lot of our work in two key program areas, one around community engagement and the other in community wealth building. And over the years, um, as an intermediary, we've been able to re-grant over $11 million in these neighborhoods and in the region um, on a number of different, in the two areas of engagement and wealth building. Um, Nexus itself also does a lot of capacity building, technical support, strategic guidance, and we do a lot of work in collaboratives and community with the overall goal of trying to build more engaged and powerful communities. So where did the BCLI come from? It came from this really great organization out in the Bay Oakland, California, who, who've been doing environmental justice advocacy for the past 20 years. Many folks are familiar with the gentrification that's happened in the Bay Area, and 20 years ago they had a um, the organization was started to respond and, and think about how does community become more integrated in the work and how um, and especially as they're most impacted by it. And but in 2009, what they started to think about was it, after years of doing a lot of advocacy was what if would it take to actually um, not just uh, have a seat at the table, but an actual vote to be the actual decision maker who receives the advocacy. And so a lot of the reason for us doing the work is that it's really an appropriate time right now in Minnesota. We all know the demographics have been shifting to become more communities of color. Already in Minnesota, there's a county that's a majority uh, community of color, as well as um, becoming older in Minnesota, so the graying. And so um, here are some statistics that speak to that fact. In addition to that, what... Um, what business leaders and political leaders have been saying is that the economy is going to require everyone to participate. And so, the time, again, based on the demographics. And so there's a number of different initiatives and a number of different cities that are saying this is the time is now for us to have to begin to think about ways to integrate communities of color and other underrepresented communities. Um, so why the BCLI at Nexus? So we struck up a great relationship with Urban Habitat um, a couple of years ago to bring the program here. And our goals are really around having people hold priority seats and making sure um, the fellows are technically and politically prepared and supported uh, for off, uh, for um, being placed in a border commission. And that in the end, policies and eventually resources, financial resources, as well as other resources, are changed to reflect and respond to community. It's really important to note that the BCLI builds on the capacity of, of several different leadership programs over the years, some of which we've actually funded here at Nexus, and that we really do see the BCLI on a broader leadership continuum. So we are not... Um, so we keep in touch with other programs out there who we think are a great complement um, to the work that we're doing, and we work in partnership with them as well. One thing we wanted to point out about the BCLI is that it's really not your typical board training. It's really a social change tool that supports, trains, and places advocate commissioners to shape the equitable policies at local government level. We really talk about looking and understanding power and systems, and believe everyone has assets and is a leader in the work, but perhaps have not been as visible in formal decision-making roles. And we also learn together. So for us, the cohort model, learning from each other, is really key, as well as developing other networks, the social capital pieces, including the networks that Nexus has with several government, nonprofit, and private sectors, and folks doing advocacy, organizing engagement, as well as folks doing um, content level work. So community development and the nonprofit world in areas like transit and health. We believe um, when we um, ac have people access other networks, they're actually better off and more prepared for their boards and commissions. So our role, um, our vision is really this um, language here. These four bullets here are actual um, 
kind of vision pieces that were actually done in a poll that was conducted around the country of what people wanted to see happen in a competitive, inclusive, and sustainable region. And this is language that everybody can agree with. And we believe that in order for us to get to this vision, we need to have a broader equity agenda that helps us um, get there. And the agenda being really intentional and requiring everyone to participate and really using this idea of targeted strategies and a focus on outcomes. And underneath an equity agenda, we really have to talk about what, what do we mean by equity. This here is a short quote from someone who's, um, who we think illustrates what equity means quite well. Equality is a, great, is a very American, very Minnesotan concept that talks about access and fairness. But what we also know is while everyone can have access, not all the outcomes are the same. And certainly all the various disparities, um, the opportunity gap, the achievement gap, the health disparity gap demonstrates that the outcomes have not been the same, particularly for communities of color and other underrepresented communities. In addition to that, um, Policy Link, which is a national organization working on equity, um, has this great definition, um, short buzzword of just and fair inclusion, which is really helpful as we talk about um, the impact and what does the work mean. Um, and what for us, one of the things the BCLI does is really begin to share that outcome, um, the outcomes, particularly at board and commission levels, are being shaped by different voices, and that we're starting to track the correct outcomes as well as maybe shift um, criteria for the way some decisions are made. And there's this great quote that um, we, uh, a colleague of ours had heard at, a, heard at a, a conference a couple of years ago that people who, that know how to operationalize change win and they win for generations. Because we know the policies are in place are ways to help undo some of the deep structural racism and institutional racism that, that's happened over the years. So therefore we have um, the BCLI program itself is a seven month leadership program that does all the piece the pieces I explained before. Train um, leaders to succeed technically and politically. We help place folks on priority seats and we connect them to local, re local, regional, and even national networks. So why are border commission? What is What exactly do they do? They have several duties um, that are required. Many of them include facilitating community input on public decisions. I know several, um, some people in the community have actually showed up at public um, hearings, some people have not, but they actually take a lot of those um, testimony into account as they research policy decisions. And at the end of the day, they're really important because they make recommendations to the appropriate decision-making authority, whether it's the city council or the mayor, but they actually make some, some decisions on policies and implementation. And one of the things we don't actually focus on, but we get a lot of questions about, are the board, not boards of nonprofit organizations. And while they're extremely important um, in uh, community institutions, we really do think they're a different skill set to navigate. Some that are similar to the BCLI, but some that are different. And then since our focus is really on systems change, we really only target publicly appointed boards and commissions and not nonprofit boards. But a really great organization, which is right now a Facebook group in the Twin Cities called Board Repair actually does. So I'd urge you to check out their website. And what we really want people to do in their role as a commissioner through the BCLI is begin to raise awareness about equity, voice the equity perspective and offer solutions, and really build visibility and power of community at this level. So now I'm going to walk you through the process, kind of the nitty gritty details about how one is either nominated or applies for the Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute. So the first thing that Terry and I do, um, we actually target all of the Boards and Commissions seats in the Twin Cities. So we look at the City of St. Paul, the City of Minneapolis, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, Hennepin County, Ramsey County, and the Metropolitan Council Committees. So that's a lot of options available, but Terry and I really start researching which one of those have the most influence in advancing equity or potential to advance equity. Um, and we, we actually attend a meeting for each of those different boards and commissions that we think are um, set up to be some influential seats that we can target for our fellows to be placed on um, and kind of to see, see what the culture and the structure of the boards or commissions are. And then we kind of narrow down based on these five issue areas as well. And this is what um, Nexus Community Partners has kind of had as our wheelhouse in our, our past 11 years that we've been in existence. We've done a lot of work in economic development, housing, jobs, transportation, and transit. And now we're newer into the field of health equity. Um, and so we choose these five issue areas. You see we don't do education. We do that because we want to make sure we can set people up for su success, and so these are where we have the networks to help leverage support for our fellows once they're appointed onto the different boards and commissions in these issue areas. 
So as I mentioned, these are kind of the target geographies that we're looking at. We have a full list of the different boards and commissions that we are targeting in the nomination packet at the end of the packet. So how does one actually become a fellow in the program? We require everyone be nominated by an organization, and that could be a lot of different kinds of organizations. You see here we have grassroots or community organizing groups. It could be a government ent entity. It could be someone that's done policy advocacy. It could be nonprofits. Uh, maybe a union, other leadership programs, and you can also be nominated by a BCLI alum from the program from the first two cohorts. And we do require that there's only one nomination per organization, one nomination per alum. And we do this because we want people to be accountable to a community, and therefore we want to make this we want to make this a very diverse group, and we want to bring in different networks so that people can expand. Um, expand their work and expand who they know so that they can all advance the different areas that they're working on through one equity agenda and we really, we really want to strengthen the equity movement and in order to do that we're requiring that only one organization can nominate one candidate each year so that again we have this diverse mix of folks that we bring together. In the actual process there's five things that have to be included in the nomination packet that you submit. From the nominator, once you've identified who might nominate you, you should have a conversation with them about which seats you want to look at and in their nomination cover sheet which is page five in the nomination packet it just has some brief information about who they are what organization they're with or who if they're a community elder or whatever you can just put that in their title um, and we just ask for some general information about how they might be able to support you once you're in the program um, they don't they're not required to check off anything on that list we just want to get a better sense of how the nominator will be able to invest in your growth through the program. And then the nominating letter, there are some prompt questions in the nomination packet about what to include in that. It's basically explaining how they know you as a person in the community and how they've seen, um, they've seen your passion for racial equity and help identify what those target seats are and why. And then from the candidate, there are three things that need to be included. So page six of the nomination packet is this nominee cover sheet. Most of that is demographic information because, again, we are trying to bring in a rich group of folks from different networks and different communities so that this is a cross-cultural, cross-sector, cross-lots-of-things experience. Um, and then a letter of interest, which there are prompts in the nomination packet as well about what to include in that. It's basically, why do you want to join the BCLI? Why do you want to serve on a board of commission to advance equity? Um, and how do you plan to do that? And then a current resume. And your resume doesn't have to be reworked for us in any particular way. We just want to know what you've kind of been up to in the community and get a little bit of better picture of who you are and what you're about. We've gotten the question, what if you're not affiliated with an organization? We say we can help connect you. And we have a really great network of organizations and people who have done work as partners with Nexus over the past 11 years. And so we can either connect you to someone doing similar work based on issue or we can help kind of walk you through your own networks and think of maybe creatively about who might be able to serve as your nominator. Again, nominations are meant to hold the candidates accountable to the broader community. So it's not because it's not just an average leadership program. And how do we select the cohort? So we're looking for a group between 12 and 15. The first year we had 12 fellows. The second year we had 15 and ended with 14. Um, and we want to keep it small enough to manage and we also again we want to make sure that we're setting people up for success once they're through the program and able to get them appointed on a board or commission and we look at all of these different things in building this cohort because again we really want a rich group of folks that are going to advance equity from a lot of different angles and bring something unique to the cohort and the experience itself and the other thing that we look at with the cohort composition is experience level so We've had folks in the past, maybe like a third of our cohorts have been already appointed and serving on their first term of a border commission. Or we've got some folks that have been maybe thinking about getting on a border commission. We had someone last year that was already starting the application process once they started applying for the BCLI and was successfully appointed as well. But we also want kind of a third of folks who maybe haven't ever even thought about being on a border commission, but they're passionate about racial equity and they're passionate about changing systems and they're maybe ready for this next step. And who the ideal candidate is that we're looking for when we select our, commit, our, our cohort, there's not a lot of things that we require, but the number one thing is being committed to social, racial, and economic justice. 
we are looking for folks of color and people from underrepresented communities. And we want to make sure that the folks we bring in have this racial equity analysis. It doesn't have to be something we're not looking for people that have a, a professional education in racial equity analysis, but we want someone that either has lived experience or experience working on an issue. Maybe it's campaigns, maybe it's something else, but really understanding that whole piece about the analysis is just understanding that there is an impact of policies and there is racial injustice with our institutions and that we're, we're trying to shift systems. And so it's more than just individual behavior that we're trying to shift. So that racial equity analysis is vital to folks that we bring into the program. And then the other things are kind of nitty gritty details. So the second one says match res residency requirements for the border commission that you're looking at. So if you live in Dakota County and you want to get appointed on a Hennepin County seat, that's not going to work. Um, and vice versa, like if it's a city of Minneapolis, you want to get seated on, but you don't live or work there, that could be an issue. But it does, usually most boards and commissions only require that you live or work. Some are a little bit different because it, it's based on different statutes. So you would just have to kind of look into that and we can walk people through that. And we do throughout the program, but just basically in general that you match the residency requirements. You have to be 18 years of age because we are again looking to set people up for success and all of the boards and commissions that we target require a voting age. Um, and then the other thing is you have to be able to attend all the monthly trainings and events. Those are listed on page three in the no nomination packet. Um, and then the other piece, the last thing is really just being able to commit to serve on a border commission after the program or starting throughout the program and being able to serve a full first term. So most of the term commitments are between two and four years. So again, that's something that is in the nomination packet if you look through the boards and commissions so that you can kind of choose based on what might work for your schedule um, as far as you know at this point. The training itself is actually between October and April. It's a seven-month training. We have one Saturday session a month, and that's from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's a long day, but we try to mix it up, and we bring in lots of different speakers. We do a lot of interactive activities. And then there's a Thursday night issue series, which is also once a month, um, and those are from 5.30 to 8 p.m. These are open to the public, and we partner with a lot of organizations. We kind of uplift some current initiatives that are happening in the racial equity movement in the Twin Cities, um, and really we try to bring in panelists that are bringing in different diverse experiences to the table. The last thing is that we do have online readings, webinars, and discussions. So there's discussion forums. We have something called a Moodle, an online learning management system, that we house all of our different assignments and then people kind of discuss what they've read. We do this because we're trying to flip the classroom so that all of the homework is done before you come to the Saturday session so that the Saturday sessions are more interactive and they're more into the applied pieces so that we can do kind of the, the housing 101 pieces ahead of time through readings and then do a deep dive on the Saturday sessions. So the curriculum highlights, these are the knowledge foundations based on the issue areas that I had mentioned earlier. So our, each Saturday session is kind of broken up by one of these. The first is really that racial equity foundation, and then we move into economic development, and then housing, and then February is transit, and then health, um, oh, and December is workforce development, and then March is health equity. So we just do one each month. And as I mentioned, the Moodle is something that um, we do have as one of the benefits for being a fellow, so that, and you'll have access to this forever once you become a fellow, um, and as an alum. And we do post all of our stuff in here so that it's accessible forever. And we also give our fellows a stipend of $500 for participating in the BCLI. And we give half of that up front, and the rest is prorated based on participation and um, attendance. So we're trying to honor people's time. We know it's not a lot of money, but we are hoping that we can honor people's time away from family and hopefully pay for a little bit of childcare costs or transit to get to the trainings and issue, issue series. So these are really all of the different modules, not all of them, but the majority of the different modules that we cover in the BCLI Saturday sessions. It's broken into three big chunks. So the political skills, technical skills, knowledge integration. So the knowledge integration are based on, they're kind of applied tools for the knowledge foundations that I mentioned, health, housing, transit, workforce, and economic development. And so we do things like community benefits agreements and we talk about transit-oriented development trade-offs. Um, and all these other things. And then political skills are really more about the art of politics. So how do you build allies once you're on this border commission? How do you negotiate and persuade and use your story to help persuade others? 
Um, and of course, we talk about self-care because it's very important as people doing stressful work. And we're, as organizers, kind of pulled in a lot of places because we're passionate people and we care about moving systems, which can be very draining. Um, and then the technical skills are really kind of those pieces to be a successful advocate commissioner. So Robert's Rules of Order is super fun. Everybody always loves talking about Robert's Rules. But it could either be a tool or it could be a weapon. So we talk about it because it's important. And we talk about message framing. We do go over municipal budgets in an interactive way that's not super draining as well. And we do some activities around writing resolutions and ethics and conflicts of interest. So the question at the bottom of this page is just really which sounds the most interesting to you and which is the least interesting or sounds the least interesting, just to kind of get kind of a feel of what might be something that you'd really be passionate about learning more about or if you're already experienced in something, how can you move that to the next level when you're getting onto a board or commission to become that advocate commissioner. So the next piece in this process is getting seated, getting placed on a board or commission. And we want to be very clear that it is the responsibility of the fellows to apply and then we kind of support through the leveraging of our relationships and networks that we have both at the cities, at the city and the county level and also through our networks of folks that might already be on the boards or commissions if we already have allies. We help walk people through that through an action plan. Um, so Terry and I do one-on-ones with all of the fellows. Um, each of us will meet with everyone at least once and we really help kind of we try to help guide through this process and we go over the application and interview prep and tr really the whole point is we're trying to set you up for success getting appointed onto these boards and commissions. So this last piece is really about expanding networks and support. We bring in a ton of different trainers that are from the field that do this stuff on the ground, have been doing it for years. Um, so people come in to do all of our trainings. Terry and I aren't the ones that do the majority of the trainings. We hardly do any of them, actually. We're more of the facilitators of the day. Um, and we host all of these really great people that are doing great work. Um, and part of that is to build the network of the folks in the, in the program and make sure that the fellows know people that they can call on once they're on a border commission to say, you know what, I remember when you talked about this. Can you explain this? Now we're going through this. I have this scenario, X, Y, Z, and people can really help support you through this process. The Thursday Night Issue Series that I mentioned earlier is we do this once a month to uplift an issue in the, in the community, um, and there are five of them throughout the year. This past year, we had these top, uh, these top bullets are really the ones that we did last year. So we did one around organizing engagement and kind of the differences and similarities, similarities between the two and how is that effective for equity. And then we talked about equitable neighborhood change kind of from the opposite of gentrification how do the communities actually get ahead of some of the development that's happening in their communities? We talked about housing and energy equity, and we, we partnered with the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy this past year to co-host this one. We really talked about the Minneapolis Clean Energy Partnership and some of the housing developments that are happening around the Twin Cities. And the budgets and equity one, we talked about a bunch of different things that are happening, because um, budgets don't sound super sexy, but the devil's in the details, right? And so there are people that are there to guide by looking into these deep dive budgets and where where is the where's the funding tied to and if we talk about racial equity like a perfect example is the city of Minneapolis which we had Brett Buckner come speak to at this issue series um, but when people start talking about racial equity and then they want to start tying money to it that's when it gets a little bit heated and that's when it's really important that we have the community pushing these forward and having advocate commissioners at the table to push for the city council members to pass it through. And so that was a really great issue series. Um, and the health impact assessments and community development was our last issue series this past program year. And we had folks coming in to talk about criminal justice reform, also um, some of the green zone initiatives and um, around transit development. And just an FYI, all of the audio is recorded from all of our issue series and archived on our website. They're mostly in 10-minute chunks, so they are digestible if you wanted to look through our speakers. Some examples of the speakers are down here, J. Bad Hart Bull, Sean Pierce, Councilmember Glidden, Linnea Atlas Ingebrigtsen, Ebony Ruland, and many more. So they're really great, and they're there for you if you do want to access them at any time. So... The alumni programming is still kind of getting underway. We have two cohorts now, and we just had a meeting recently for folks to get to know each other and really start talking about how we're going to build equity together. Um, we don't just get people through the program and say, all right, you're done, congrats, goodbye. 
We do continue to communicate, to um, support, and help bring people to other commission tables if that's something they're interested in. And we continue to build networks for folks, um, or with folks, I should say. And it's really exciting what the alum of our past two years are talking about doing. And so being a part of that alumni network is something that's going to be really powerful as we start stacking the decks on these different boards and commissions. So a little, this is Terry Tao again. I want to talk with you a little bit about our BCLI alumni to date. So to date, we've had two cohorts. We started the program in 2013 of 26 graduates, the majority of which identify with the community of color or underrepresented community. And what we've really heard from them is that they've seen some increased leadership visibility and effectiveness in their leadership work in community. What we also know about the impact of the work is that we've been able to place quite a few of our, our fellows, especially from the first year, and we're working on this year's um, graduates um, in actual boards and commissions so far. And here's an example of a couple of the boards and commissions they sit on. We also wanted to talk, share a little bit about our partners in Oakland to see how many people they've graduated and some of the boards and commissions they've been able to place people on too. So these are the important dates for this program year for 2015 and 2016. May 4th was when we opened the nominations. June 26th is the absolute deadline. It's a Friday by midnight. All applications and nomination packets must be submitted or postmarked so that we get them by the beginning of the next week. August is when we hold interviews. We have a community um, selection committee of folks that are doing work in the community to help us select the cohort. And September 1st is when we'll announce who the finalists are. October 8th is our launch event for this year. And then the trainings actually start later in October and they go through March and the graduation is April 14th. And all of the other issue series dates and the training dates, all of those are in the nomination packet. So if you ever have any questions, you are welcome to contact either Terry or I about anything that we can walk you through the process, we can help connect you if you don't have a nominator or if you are thinking about nominating someone else, um, we'd be happy to talk to anyone. So this is our contact information and Thanks for your interest in the BCLI. We hope to hear from you soon.